So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, lecture on testing techniques. Uh, we uh, today we're gonna just check if the if the sound is okay. Good. So, so uh, again, welcome. Today we will uh, continue where we we uh, finished last week. Uh, uh, and, and today the focus will be on, on the practical testing techniques. Well, the things that you will work with uh, when you uh, uh, design your tests, uh, derive the test data, uh, implement the tests and, and, and execute and, and uh, uh, analyze the, the, the results. So, uh, you remember this uh, uh, picture here where we, uh, well, more or less threw everything we had on the table. So, so this, this guy here could be used to, to, uh, to, to describe any test product because you could create these hierarchical structures, okay? And, and last week we, we talked about, well, this management process coming up with a plan uh, where, you, where you had to well, first figure out what types of objectives you had for your test. Was it just functionality or were there some qualities involved that you should test for? Uh, and then uh, the, the, uh, the different test types. Uh, and, and that was uh, hmm, more uh, uh, focused on, 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 well, well, the test object that you will test. Was it the, just the small part of the system or was it some, some somewhat larger composition of, of parts or was it the entire system? And, and we could use all this to, to, to capture this. And, and, and at this top level here, uh, we had the organizational test process, which was, well, how an organization, how a company uh, organizes their test projects. So, so that feeds into to, to this model and, and then you have one test management process per project and then you create this hierarchy of static test processes, that was the, the review stuff. Uh, additional test management processes, if you well, need a hierarchy to address different objectives, different levels or combinations of those. And then we had the dynamic test process and that was concerned with the more traditional uh, hey, let's uh, execute our software, exercise our software in a way that we can, can control the execution and we can observe uh, the, the, uh, the, the state and, 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 and the result of, of, of uh, uh, whatever, whatever exercise we're, we're running. So, uh, today we will focus on uh, dynamic uh, test processes and primarily for functionality. I, I, this is an introduction course. I don't expect you guys to become performance uh, testing experts or usability experts or, or security experts. Functionality is difficult enough. So, so we stay there and, and uh, well, you guys uh, uh, can, can then later decide if you want to specialize in any of the other areas. But, but uh, uh, right now, dynamic tests for functionality. So, now we're going to try first to, to put this into some context. So, so, in one of the first lectures we were talking about how to, to organize an uh, incremental iterative development process. And, and the way we did that was to have, well, first a long-term planning, well, uh, weeks, months away. Uh, 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 rough plan with uh, milestones, more or less, uh, to, 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 to figure out which different phases do we have to get through in order to, to finish uh, with a complete product that we can deliver to customers. And then, well, we have this, this uh, more, well, uh, well short-term planning. Uh, because, well, we have sufficient information to provide a, a short-term plan for maybe a week to three weeks, not more. After three weeks, there is too much uncertainty. And of course, it's the same here for testing. Uh, but one of the important things with, with 
well, testing, uh, architecture, things that, that, well, we will do for all parts of the, or things that will have an effect on all parts of the system is this integrity. So we have to have some uh, decisions made that are general decisions that are uh, for all, uh, um, uh, for the entire system. So, so uh, the test plan here is, is, is that document that, that sets the, the rules for testing. Uh, and it should set the test objectives. For what do we test? Is it functionality? Is it performance, security? What are the, the, the key uh, concerns that must be tested for, uh, for this product? Uh, connected to that is, is for what do we, well, we know what uh, we test for, but what do we test? What are the smallest pieces we test? Is it the unit? Is it a class? Is it the method? Well, what's the unit? What's the smallest piece? What type of integrations do we test? Is it a complete subsystem, or are there something in between that we, when we start testing integrations? Uh, what type of tests do we run for the complete system? Well, these decisions must be made before we start the actual development, because they will impact testing when it's down in the leaves of this decomposition tree. Today we're going to focus on how we test. And, and as you will see, and well, there is, uh, uh, they are connected to, to the type of test and which technique we use. So if you look at the test objective, performance, on the integration level, well, we have some techniques available. So some test techniques targets a single objective for a single type. Others are slightly more generic and can be applied for several objectives in, for different uh, test types. Another aspect of, of the test plan is, is the test environment. So, so what does our test environment look like? Not just if we use some, some X unit framework like uh, J unit or so for our, our, our uh, well, maintaining our test suites and, uh, and, and execute our text, test suites. It's, it's other things that are uh, also highly relevant here. Uh, how do you set and, and, and reset your, your uh, state for your applications and so on? And, and uh, also, how do you maintain all the uh, test results for, for further analysis? Okay, so we spent time on this last time. And this is similar to project plan. Make a plan for the entire project. Not all the details, but enough instructions so that people work in the same way throughout the project. And now we're looking at this dynamic test process. And, and what you see here is a process that will be gone through at least once, possibly more than once, in each and every iteration. So. We will design and implement tests. We will set up our test environment. We will execute the tests and uh, verify the results. That we will do several times in each and every iteration. But in the first iterations, when we just talk about well, high-level requirements, uh, vision documents, and so on, probably not, if any testing like this. But if you go down to the, to the construction phase where we actually set and, 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 and implement features for the system, uh, 
in a very short, uh, have a very short time frame, maybe we're talking about days, well, this will go on, well, constantly in, in, in the team during one iteration. So each developer will go through this a couple of times for each iteration. So, uh, of course, for that we need a different planning. So for the iteration, we need some short-term planning. Because remember that testing takes time. So it's not just development, design and development, it's testing. And, and testing often takes as much time as the other two. So you have to be aware of that. And, and when you come to your iteration, you have, well, the chunk of, well, the workload, the things you, have, you will deliver in this iteration, the increment. That decides which tests you have to go through, which dynamic tests you have to go through. It decides which uh, uh, test types, which uh, testing techniques you will use. So it's first at that point when you make that decision that we will, well, pr produce this increment in this iteration. It's first then when you know enough to come up with a detailed plan. So that's why you have this iterative way where you actually do a detailed test plan, planning, I should say, a detailed test planning in each, for each iteration. So what you have is something that, well, you've seen this before. You remember? The work breakdown structure, where you uh, decompose tasks. And then, well, if this is iteration one, you can do the detailed planning for iteration one before you start doing the, the detailed planning for iteration two. So, so you will grow this work breakdown structure for testing during each iteration. When you have the information about what to test, you can start to do the detailed planning for the testing. And one thing, I, I'm sure I cannot emphasize this too much. Testing require, requires lots of resources, lots of resources. It's time consuming, not just executing tests, but setting everything up, developing test scripts, implementing, uh, uh, well, the test code, connect it into your test suites. It takes time, lots of time. So you must be aware of this so that you can include this in your planning. I've seen numerous examples of, of, of beginners when they start planning their, their iterations. They, okay, which use cases can we implement in this iteration? Well, we can this, that, that, that ends up with a list of eight, okay? And then, a week later, how much have they managed? Well, we just managed two because there were all this testing. So include this in your iteration planning. It's so important that you have time to do the tests. Because what, are, what is the usual mistake we make when we plan? It will take, and I, I think that you guys have learned this to some extent, the hard way. When you plan, you plan for success. 15 minutes, sure. No problems, everything is crystal clear. 15 minutes, it works. But Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will, okay? So, if you plan for your tests in a way that, okay, all tests we run will succeed, okay, fine. But the problem is that you can make mistakes when you design and implement your tests, you need to correct errors in your test suite. It's also the fact that, that the tests can, of course, generate failures in the test objects you're testing, okay? 
So you need to correct that too. More time, more time. So, so this is actually very difficult to get right. So, so maybe you need to be very flexible in terms of, well, how much work, the chunk of work you accept for an iteration or you plan for an iteration. So, uh, as you saw on this dynamic test process, you need to prepare, you need to execute, you need to analyze. And they require time. Okay, so, dynamic testing. Now we have to figure out why, we have to figure out what, and we have to figure out how. Okay. So, why do you test? Well, the most common objective for testing is what do you test for most commonly? So, anyone? Error. Errors or, uh, well, deviations from the intended behavior. So, so uh, that's why you, you, the functionality. I assume that was what you meant when you said error. The problem is that deviation from specification can also uh, be used when you talk about performance or when you talk about security. And that's not necessarily functionality. But why? The most common objective is functionality. So what? What do we test? What are the most common test object? in a software system. And now you have to think, OK, we have the system at up here. And then we decompose the system numerous times. And at, at the very bottom here, we have leaves. What are the leaves down here? They are probably, well, at least if you count the number of leaves, it's more than the other nodes. So, so what are these leaves in a software system? Anyone? Any idea? It could be a, a method. Some, some uh, uh, object or some class that you want to exercise. So that is the most common test object, the what. And now we have to, to combine the two. So, why are we testing? We're testing for, for functionality, to validate that the system satisfy, satisfies the functionality, well, the functional requirements we have. And what do we test? Well, most commonly we test these, these leaf nodes here, the, the methods or the, 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 the classes or the complete objects. So combining the two, well, that will tell us a bit about the technique we should use. So, so combining these three, and you remember this, well, what, why, and how will give us a test suite. So, so for, if it's a small system, the entire system, or for some subsystem, if it's a somewhat bigger, larger system, well, you will have different test suites or a single test suite. One test suite that could just address the uh, uh, tests of the smallest units for uh, functional defects or any combination for any type of uh, other objective and, and, and test type. But the test suite here is central. So, so this is a collection of, of test cases. You remember now the, the terminology we talked about last week. Uh, groups of test cases, different objects, uh, uh, sorry, different objectives, different techniques. We group them together. And the reason why we put them into a test suite, you will see that at, at one of the last slides of today's lecture, that is that we want to be able to, to quickly uh, rerun or exercise our systems in different ways. So we want to be able to pick and choose among the test cases, putting together different uh, 
configurations of our tests, depending upon what we have done to our system. So we talked about the test objective, test object. This is the test level and or test phase. And, and if, you, if you look at a, a greenfield project where you start with nothing and you end up with the system, uh, initial development here, what you have is, is four levels in principle. You have a unit test, you have an integration level, you have a system level, and then you have the acceptance test. And, and these vary in different aspects. So, so the unit here, uh, unit test, is, is uh, typically concerned with the, the smallest units, of course. The, the leaves in the, the system decomposition are methods or our objects classes. And, and the typical objective is for functionality defects to make sure that, that these implementations are defect free. If you go up to, to integration tests, well, functionality is still there. You test integrations, putting several objects together or putting several subsystems together sometimes. Testing the composition, testing what will happen if we put these guys together. We know that each and every unit is working because it's passed the unit tests put them together, and now we make sure that they work when they are put together and are when they are collaborating. And when we have our integrations working, we can take these integrations and put them together, and eventually we will end up with a complete system. And for a complete system, of course, we can test it for functionality, but we can also, and that we can, can do also already on the integration level, start testing for different types of, of other concerns, performance, security, well, other quality concerns. The final one, the acceptance test, what is that about? Well, the first three tests are completely focused on testing different, at different levels. But it's done in-house. A test where you exercise your software in-house, in your own controllable, observable environment. Okay? But the acceptance test is something that you run on the customer's site when you put your system into its real context. So no mock-ups, no faking in the making, it's just your system deployed in the real context. And acceptance means the customer now makes a decision. Are we satisfied or not? If they are, they sign off. And typically, you can send the invoice and get paid. If not, it goes back, and you have some, some, some uh, period where you address the bugs that you have found. You come back during your, all these tests here, of course, and you have a new acceptance test. OK. So, what we're talking about now is the lowest level. We focus on the unit today, or at least before the break. After the break, we will say a few words about the integration tests. So class or method or object, that's, that's the smallest unit, typically a method. Techniques. Well, we have dynamic testing techniques, and this is where we will spend the time today. But of course, there are also static testing techniques. Code standards, language, reviews of the code. Have your colleague reading your code 
if you if you connect this to, to something not completely different, but something different. Uh, the, the engineering practices in, in, in uh, agile programming, there is something called pair programming. Pair programming, well, you have an extra pair of eyes, so you get this static testing while coding to some extent. Here, if you have a review, you make it a separate activity. But we're going to focus on dynamic testing and code. What do you think about when you hear code? Well, a lot. And what I mean is a lot of code. We're talking about lines of code in the hundreds of thousands. We're talking about lines of code in the millions. And now we want to test all our methods to make sure that they are behaving according to specification, that there are no defects there. The functionality is correct. Since we have a lot of code uh, over the years, people have uh, realized that, well, this is not something that you do by hand all the time. For the really large products, you need help. You need lots of help. And there are tools that can generate test cases for you. There are tools that, well, as you have seen, for instance, the, the uh, JUnit helps you executing. There are other testing frameworks that helps you exercising your system, executing your test cases. What we will see today is, is uh, we will look at the concept called code coverage. How much code of the code, to what percentage do you cover your code? That's a measure of how good your tests are. For that, we have several different tools. Then we have the emulators and the simulators for the mockups, the execution environment. But unit tests, we write our test specifications based on the specifications for a class, the specification for a method, well, our design specifications. So, a lot of code. We have a lot of code. And testing is resource demanding, not just designing coding, it's also resource demanding if you consider time Exercising all the tests can take hours, can take a full day. And this is why it's so important that you can configure your test suites, that you can pick and choose with which test cases. Do you remember one of the slides where I had like a, a photo from, from another uh, slideshow? Showing how a very big company in, in, in the search engine business well, they calculated dependencies and then branched out running tests in parallel just to speed things up and then merging the results back together with this map reduce approach. Well, exercising our system can be so resource demanding that, well, if you start your tests and you have to wait, well, the company will, of course, the product will lose momentum, spend resources of, of people waiting for, for a result. Because it can be millions of tests, as you saw, that needs to be exercised. And that takes time. So for the really big uh, systems, they, there are many different. You have this continuous integration where you have a continuous test, build test, integrate cycle, but, but uh, Microsoft, for instance, they, they have a, a daily build, what they call it, a very common approach where as a developer you're expected to check in uh, your work at the, uh, well, before you leave and, and make, it sh make sure it works before you, you, you leave the building. 
So you can actually have every night a complete build of the system where you can run all the tests overnight and when you get back to work in the in the morning you have the results so you can well possibly fix the bugs if any but what's important here is on this level you should exercise your system in a way that you cover as much code because the code is the representation of the the functionality as much code as possible with as few test cases as possible. Because each test case takes time. It can just be, well, a fraction of a second, but still time. And if we talk about millions and a fraction of seconds, that transforms, translates into to hours, to days. So minimal set cover as much as possible. And then, at this level, there are two possibilities. Either we have access to the source code, or we don't. If we have access to the source code, we use certain techniques. If we don't, we use different te other techniques. And today we're going to look at, at two different techniques because one black box and one white box or structural. And, and, and the reason is that, well, even though we don't have access to the, to the source code, we must achieve this, this controllability where we can actually control the execution to a point in the code that we want to test and set the state to a specific state where we want to test the code. And we must also be able to, 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 to uh, observe the behavior. What's going on? How, what, how, is, how is the code behaving here? And that, of course, if we have access to the source code, you can, well, imagine the techniques look different compared to if you don't have access to the source code. And that's what we're going to look at, because the goals for the test case are the same. You must reach a fault. You must produce an error. You must make the error visible as a failure. And if you have the source code, you can, like, cheat. You can actually look at the source code. And you don't have that option uh, if you have black box, if it's considered as a function. So, you have the test object, and we're interested in the behavior in the state here to make sure that it's defect free. So, we send in some test data to our test object, and in our case, it's a method, say, and we get the test result. And given some preset test environment, we can compare the test data or the test result with an expected result. That's control. That's controllable. So in here, what can we control? We described this slightly last week. We can control the test object's state. Remember the list? We could actually create objects, so they have a, a linked structure with three objects. That's controlling the state of the object we want to test. We can control the test environment. Slightly more difficult because we have these external systems, but we use the mockups for that, helping us controlling the state of the test environment. And then, of course, we have the test data, selecting, well, the actual parameters that we use when we invoke a method. And that's what we're going to use when we exercise different parts of the code. Because we all know that the control structures in our code, ifs, for, uh, loops, etc., they are controlled by these parameters, or controllable by these parameters. So, 
we can control the behavior of the test object by setting the states with our test fixture, setting the test environment state with our test fixture and the mockups, and controlling the test data, part of the signature, the actual parameters that we are sending to the object, receiving object. And then take care of the test result because we need to verify it with the expected. So, structural testing. And it is actually like, like this uh, little guy jumping up and down. It's, it's similar. It is similar because we want to jump over the entire structure to make sure that there are no weaknesses. And the more we cover of the structure, the more evidence we have, the more convinced we can be that the structure is capable, that the structure is defect free. The benefit with software is, of course, that it doesn't matter if you jump up and down one time or two million times, the structure will not fatigue just by you jumping up and down compared to this physical object. But what you do here on a structural level is that you analyze the unit and say it's a method. Well, you analyze the unit, the method, its signature. So which parameters do we have and what is uh, the resulting type over here? Look at the specification. And now you have to go to the design document, the design specification. This little method should do this. So based on that, well, you can come up with the expected result. If I send in these parameters, I expect this result. OK, now we have the harness here, the implementation. And that is safety harness in, in terms of, well, making sure that we don't forget any of the specification, any of the uh, signature here. Because we're going to use the implementation to derive the test cases and make sure that we are jumping up and down on as many ice blocks as possible with a minimum number of jumps, if you understand what I mean. So we generate test data to cover code. And this is the approach. Select the coverage criteria, because, well, there are different ways to, to, to uh, define coverage. Generate something called a control flow graph. Then we have to instrument the code so that we can determine if this little piece of the code has been exercised or not. Now we can start deriving the test cases and we can execute the tests. And while we were executing the tests, we were storing this information if some little part of the code was exercised. And now we can compare that data to, well, the code and make sure that, well, we have sufficient coverage. If not, we have to go back and come up with some more test cases. Rerun the tests, check the coverage, and when we're happy, we're happy. If we're not happy, we redo it again. So coverage criteria. Well, here are some, a few. Uh, there is one called all paths. That's not feasible. Because what you will have here is, a, is a, a combinatorial explosion. Because all paths means all paths. So if you have a while statement with a while statement with a while statement, and some if statements in between, well, say that the uh, outermost uh, uh, while statement has n as the upper limit for the iteration counter. And then we have m for the middle one and, and, and some other. Well, it's n times m times, well, possible paths. And that can be millions, billions. So, so we have to find some other criteria here. We cannot cover all possible paths. 
So it's not feasible. Instead, we work with something called statement coverage. That is that each and every statement in your code should be exercised. Branch coverage, each and every branch should be exercised. Decision coverage, well, each and every decision should be exercised. I'm going to show you these a little bit more uh, in detail shortly. An example. Here we have a method. It's not pseudocode, but I, I guess you guys can, can, and can speak universal programming language, so it's pretty similar. We have, in this little snippet of code, in this little method, how many paths? How many possible paths through this piece of code? Two. Two. Yes. Good. Did you guess or? No, no, no? Yeah. If. It's not the if. It's the if here that gives us two. Because we have this one. This arrow here means that the criteria there, the if criteria, is false. Goes straight down there. OK. And then we have this one where the if state criteria was true. That would give us two paths. So in principle, we could be happy here saying that, OK, to test this uh, little uh, uh, method for, state, uh, for branch coverage, how many test cases do we need? How many test cases would you write to test this and achieve 100% branch coverage? How many, branch, how many paths do we have? Two. How many branches do we have? Two. So one test where the if statement is false and one test where the if statement is true. That will give us a branch coverage of 100%. If you look at the statement coverage, how many would we need, do we need? To cover, well, how many statements do we have? First, we have an assignment. Let's call that the statement. Then we have the if statement. Then we have the inside if statement, an increment. And then we have the return. So in principle, we just need one. Because we will cover all statements. But there is more to it because, well, look at this if statement. How many of you admit that writing up correct uh, logical expressions for your selections or your loops is where you make most mistakes when coding? Well, I admit, this is, this is difficult. This is where we make mistakes. So what I want to test here is decision coverage. OK, so what you see here is that, well, how many decisions do you make here? Yeah, you make one decision, which is either true or false for the entire expression here, for the full expression. But then you have two parts here, and a connective in the middle that says and. And that means, hey, we have a complete table. So to get decision coverage for this little guy here, how many test cases are needed? Four. Four. Yes. Good. You can see here that, well, we want to exercise as much of the code for a criteria as possible with as few test cases as possible. We want to minimize the number of test cases. So depending upon which criteria you pick and choose, you can di get different numbers of test cases because you're still striving for 100%. So here you have another, well, 
funny structure, just to prove a point. You have some nested if statements here. There is one blue test case that gives us one path through. This is what we have here. 50%, 33%, 25%. So we need to measure coverage. And for that, we use instrumentation. We throw in some extra code. Simple code that measures, or I should say, it's usually just some little uh, counter being incremented. So you add code to the code you test, instrument. And then this extra code generates test data then, that you can observe, that you can analyze after the fact to, well, calculate coverage. So that's it for the break, uh, before the break. Uh, the reasons why we don't, sorry, the reasons why we don't have them in the code, why we use this instrumentation technique is, of course, that we don't want a lot of extra code in our, in our production code. We add it for testing. OK, that's it before the break. Uh, after the break, we will continue with our structural testing, looking at the control flow graph. Uh, I would say 10 minutes break, OK? OK, welcome back to, to the second half of this uh, testing techniques lecture. So, so when we started to, to, to look at the, the detailed uh, algorithm uh, for, for structural testing, uh, there was a new concept, the control flow graph. The graph, you actually uh, get rid of several statements and define something called basic blocks. Uh, and a control uh, flow graph contains all traverse traversable paths within some piece of code or a program that you execute. And, and you, can, you, don't, you don't derive a control graph for entire systems, typically, not for, for these purposes. You just focus. You derive a control flow, flow graph for a method. But uh, each node in the graph, each node, as you will see, as a depicted as a circle, uh, represents something called a basic block. And a basic block contains a sequence of code. You remember what we wanted to achieve this sequence uh, statement coverage? And if we know that we have a sequence of statements, we know that if we execute this at the top of the sequence, we will also execute this at the very bottom. And that's why we define a basic block as uh, a place where, well, you come in with a jump. And then there is always, at the end of a block, a jump out. So jump in or jump out. It means that we have a sequence of statements in between. Uh, now you have the nodes representing the basic blocks and then you have directed uh, edges. So the, the arrows that represents the jumps into a basic block or the jumps out from a basic block. Uh, for a basic block, we have entry blocks and we have exit blocks, where, where we start or where we exit. So how can we use this? Well, again, this little pseudocode-like uh, method here, uh, I rec recognize parts of it maybe. Uh, what you can see here is, OK, let's start looking for a sequence. We start with a while, and, and what, what is the character of a while? Well, it's actually a, one of these statements that contains two possible paths, two jumps. Okay? Either this while condition is true or it's false. So you have true and you have false. Okay? And now we start with the true one, which means that we go into the, uh, uh, to, to the while loop. And here we have two 
we have a basic block consisting of the, the if statement, or the, the assignment, sorry, and the if statement here. But the if statement was an exit because that's where we have these exits. We can either go if it's false, if x is not equal to 10, we can go back. We will go back up to the while, or we go to, to 6. Okay? And now we can see that the, the uh, falls from the while also goes to, to 6 here. Okay? 6 consists of an if statement, true or false. 7 or 10. OK? And then both of these will come together in 12. Fairly straightforward. OK, now I'm going to make life a little bit more difficult for you, because I'm going to take this graph and I'm going to shake it a bit, but it's the same graph. OK. Uh, doesn't look exactly the way it looks. So now we're going to look at statement coverage. Statement coverage? What was that? Well, oops, sorry, that should be, well, uh, this is, uh, of course, number 12 here, the return. But now let's see what happens if we exercise this uh, control graph with uh, the parameter x equal, set to 20 and y set to 10. What will happen? Well, we will exercise these statements. All statements in these basic blocks will be exercised. The one that will not be exercised is the one in number 10. The y equals uh, y minus 20. So what we can say now is that, well, this test case where we set the test data to x equals 20, y equals 10, it's not sufficient to get statement coverage for this little method here. We need one more test case. Okay, so what should we change? Well, we have to get into the, uh, to the y equals y minus 20 down there on, on row 10. Okay, it means that it's a multi-condition that must be true, which means that both must be uh, one of them must be false, okay? Because it's an and in the middle. So if one of the if one of the either one of these is false, the expression will be false because and requires that both are true to be true, true, okay? Okay, so, so y is not affected by the first while loop, uh, so just set y to something greater than 20. Or, well, if if we set it to, to greater than 20, this will never be true, okay? So we will never end up here. We will end up there. So we set it to 30. And that means that we get coverage here, this coverage. So two test cases, full coverage. What you can see now is, is, is if we talk about the other, another criteria here, branch coverage exercising with the same test cases. Well, since we touched all basic blocks in the control flow, flow graph, it's, it doesn't come as a surprise to us that, OK, these two test cases will actually exercise all the branches in uh, this, uh, uh, um, in this uh, uh, control graph. OK, so two different coverage criteria. You analyze the control graph, flow graph, uh, 
and you start to derive the test data that you, you, you uh, include in your, in, your, in your test code. So have you, you have written some test cases by now, haven't you? Have you written some test code? Did you do any analysis like this? Did you think of coverage? Probably not. But it's a straightforward way of, of making sure that at least we exercise everything. Because this can also be an indication that if it's extremely difficult to, to get to a basic block, people have proven that code that is difficult to test is also more error prone. So the more complex structures of ifs and whiles and well different control, control structures, the more difficult it will be to find one path down to this little statement here that you want to exercise. And we all know that the devil can be found in the details in these expressions that we use to well steer these control structures in one or the other direction. So the more control structure we have, the more conditions we have, the more likely it is that we make mistakes. So just exercising a control flow graph here can also reveal spots that are difficult to test. And that's an indication of, well, maybe you should do something about your implementation. Coverage tools. Uh, this is a very simple example. I, I had it installed uh, on my machine five years ago when I took this screenshot. Uh, it's, well, you can see the color here. It, you exercise, you run your test cases, they instrument the code, collect the data. Here is a, well, you can see the red one here wasn't exercised. There are two statements not exercised. The green ones are uh, all, uh, exercised. Uh, since it's an else if else, that's why, well, there is actually an opportunity not to get into that uh, second return there. Uh, then we have the yellow one, and that is probably, since this is an if statement uh, addressed as this uh, conditional statement, it's, it's just as, well, we have probably just uh, one condition tested here, not the second one. So you can use a tool to help you analyzing the quality of your tests. So now we have controllability and observable. We can control and we can observe. That's good. That's very good. But now, if we don't have access to the source code, if the guy in the middle there is an unknown, the only thing we know is the, the signature and the specification. What should we do? Well, controllability is back on square one. We cannot fake look at the, course, uh, the, the code to, to see how we should control. We have to do something else. And this example here, when you don't see the internals, is actually something that is very common when we test one level up when we test our integrations. Because then we assume that we have pre-tested units working and then we put them together. And, and often the source code goes away because the, these parts are, well, now available as, as, as uh, uh, well, we don't have that access because we're dealing with multiple different objects and, and, and we don't have the access to the source code anymore. So on the integration level, well, Test objectives are similar, functionality, but it could also be quality. Uh, you see, white box is there, so you can do integration testing white box, but, but I would say that black box is much more common. On this level, you can also start to, well, remember that we saw our use cases, then we had the collaboration of objects implementing the use cases the use cases can be seen as the functional specifications here for the integration level. Let me show you an example of that. But black box testing in principle is about this. 
you have some, some known test, test data because you know the types of your parameters. So if it's integers, if it's characters, if it's strings and so on, you know the, you know the test data domain, okay? And now your, your challenge here is, is to come up with a mapping based on the specification of the function, well, that maps the input to the expected output. So how can you do that without knowing the internals? Well, this is a very common problem. One example is, is API. Oops, don't know what happened here. It should say API, but, but uh, 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 not pi. And it's not, it's actually the green one, one here that should say A, P, and I. What happens when you move from, from OS X to Windows, I, I guess. So you know the API of an object. You know the API of a subsystem. You know the API of, of some platform, some framework. You know the API. But you, you cannot exercise based on, on all the uh, structures inside. Sometimes you're, you don't have access to it. Sometimes it's just too much code. So you have to think slightly different. And, and what we can do here is, of course, still a test case with uh, data. So we'll look at the different signatures in the API. And well, we observe the test result. We can still do that. It's like a black box. What happens if I push? push uh, that button. Well, okay, the green lamp is turned on. What happens if I push that? Well, you can, you can without considering the internals, see if something is, is working according to specification. But here, for the API, since you have many different uh, uh, methods, you need multiple, yeah, there you can see the A for the API. Uh, so you have a couple of test cases, many test cases, exercising the API now. We can still control, and we can observe, we can still control the test case and we can still control the test environment. But we cannot study the code. That's our challenge. So, Okay, so we have a question. If a comp combinatorial explosion exists in lower test levels, how can we build reasonable integration tests? What I say is that what's important on the integration level is that you, you do your unit tests first. So you know that these guys are working according to specification. On the integration level, you are concerned with making sure that the working parts work together. So, so if you don't do your unit testing, start integration testing immediately, you don't know really if it's like a malfunctioning part or if it's malfunctioning in the, well, collaboration with other objects. Even if we design good tests at low level, can tests be designed at high level? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I don't really get that question. Even if we design good tests at a low level, can tests be designed at a higher level that can be trusted? No, that's obvious. If you, if you design good tests at the lower levels, that's a prerequisite to have trust in the levels above on the integration and system level. Because that's part of the assumption that these units are working. So back to this, black box testing. And now we're going to look at something called category partitioning. And this is, this is to some extent what you see, uh, uh, well, you will, you will uh, use a system where you reveal, reveal the internals of a function without having access to the code. So, so you analyze the, the function under test, which means that you can in an API, you have the signature and you have the specification. We can control the test data, we can control the test environment. And we can derive an expected result that we can compare to the actual result we observe. 
So, in order to, to, to uh, well, have some, some, some control over the, the numbers of test cases, this category partitioning technique is, is recognizing the fact that there will be equivalent inputs. So, if you add an element to a linked list once, or if you add an element to a linked list of length 2, or length 3, or length 5, or length 8, or length 9, it's the same. It's the same code that is exercised. So you don't have to redo these tests. So you should remove these redundant tests, and you do that by finding these partitions. So, so for this adding an element to a linked data structure, well, add an element to an empty list, add an element to a list with one element, and add an element to a list with two elements. Maybe you don't have more partitions. So three test cases would be sufficient. So now if we use this approach, we can actually reduce the, remove the redundant tests and, and minimize the size of the test suite. And that was something that we strive for. And the trick here is, is the same as for, for what we used for, for controlling the execution when we knew the structure. But we, well, we use the same, the test data, the input to control. And, and look at the boundary values here. Reading the specification, an experienced programmer will have some understanding about what the boundary values are. And the boundary values are when control goes in different ways. So if I ask you to test the linked structure, most of you with some experience would say, okay, let's test the empty. Let's test with one, and let's test with two. You, you, you would well do that intuitively because you have implemented that type of functionality, that type of structure so many times. And that's exactly what you're reusing here, that knowledge when you design your test case. So even without knowing about the internals, you can actually control. It will not be as precise as for the structural, but good enough. So, take a specification, decompose it into a unit, and a unit can be a method here. So let's look for this, at the specification for a unit, look at the parameters, look at the state that this method is concerned with, and now try to find categories in the state and in the parameters. So for a linked structure, like the list, the state can vary, empty, one, or two, okay? That's the state you control, I have full control over that. Parameters, well, if you add an element, or you add an element again, or an add an you, you don't really vary the parameters there, in that example. So now we have a couple of partitions where we can have choices. So we had an empty structure, a structure with one, and a structure with two. But the two can actually be replaced by, by three, or six, or eight. It doesn't matter. So that's me, what I mean by a partition, where you have choices. Now we use this, this knowledge. Three, uh, uh, well, one category, in the state, that's the size of the linked structure, uh, a partition, which is empty, one element, or more than one element. And now we have choices, and we can write the test specification with three test cases, and it can be empty, it can be one, and it can be any more, any length larger than one. But it doesn't have to be 55. Five will do exercise exactly the same code. Three will also do that. So now we have the test data, we can implement the test case, and that's the way it works. And this also works on the API level, of course. You have the specification, you have the parameters, you have to start thinking about what can the state be here, 
of the environment and start playing around. If you can control it, you can uh, do a little there. Then you can control the parameters and you can test the beha behavior if it's the expected behavior you get when you get, observe the actual result. So here's a sorting example. You guys, you, you, you should know a, a sorting algorithm uh, in search and sort or something like that. You have an input, you have an array as input. Type doesn't really matter. Uh, output is a permutation. It means that you have, well, or arranged elements and uh, in, the, in the array, and it's now sorted. And there's also a maximum value and a minimum value. Uh, so, so this is the specification. The parameter is, is the array, okay? Uh, if we look at categories here, array size, in the same way as we had this, the size of the link structure, the array size is also uh, important here, okay? Uh, so if it's a, 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 an, an empty array, well, or if it's an array with one element, or if it's an array with two or more elements, well, you can see that, okay, if we're gonna sort an empty array, that's a, that's a boundary value, that's, a, that's an exception. No, well, well, it's so easy that you forget that little special case when you code, okay? It's a boundary value, we, we look at that. So we have some categories there, the type of elements, hmm, not really relevant. It doesn't really matter as long as we have some uh, operator where we can compare if one element is greater or equal than some other element of the same type. Well, it doesn't really matter. Then we have the maximum value and the minimum value. And it can play a role. Because if the maximum value is the same as the minimum value, Well, it could be that we have an array of exactly the same numbers, or it not can be, it is. So maybe that's an exception, a boundary value that we should check. So and then we have the position of max and min values, because believe it or not, I've seen so many implementations of sorting algorithms that if you have the minimum, well, if you provide a sorted list as input, for instance, uh, you can be sure that some of the assignments will actually sort it so that it's unsorted. But choices, size, type, max min, max position, min position, well, from these, these categories, you define different partitions, and these are the partitions here, 0, 1, 2 to 100, 100 to infinity. The reason why I had a fourth one there is that maybe we have a maximum uh, size or we want to test a large one just to make sure that we run, uh, we're also capable of that. So for the test data, well, among these partitions, we have choices, okay? So this is just, a, to, to confuse you guys, this is a, a, an array of size zero. Uh, we can't really say anything about the position of max and minimum here because there are no elements. Uh, but we can say that the maximum is not equal to the minimum because there is no, okay? Anyhow, this is a test case. This is something that we can use to, 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 to set up the, the, the state, the environment, and we can, we can exercise the sorting on this, this, uh, this state. Continuing, well, we can have one, uh, an array of length one. That was the uh, second uh, partition of that category. Uh, here we can say that the position of max and the position of min is at the head, okay, and max equals min is true. Uh, you can't come up with a test case where that is false because there's only one element. Then 
continuing size two you can see now we start to get into this more and more because the more elements we have the more state space we have so the more state space we have the more test cases we need to cover that state space so here we start to vary where the uh, position of max and min if max and min are equal and you go on like that and you come up with a specification for a test frame for that uh, method you write up your your and implement your 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 test cases for that method so you actually do this without knowing about the implementation but what are you doing here's some pseudocode insertion sort so what are you doing here well the boundary values you're actually exercising length okay what what are the partitions up there okay so this for loop you can see it's a conditions again it's conditions again that control the execution control flow of your application that's what we're controlling here by looking at the the parameters the state the categories the partitions and the choices So, look here, for i, where i is assigned 1 to length of a, which is 0 minus 1, okay, from 1 to minus 1, we're into trouble here, okay, we have a strange loop here that goes from 1 to minus 1 with the first test case. So you see, that's how we find flaws. So for this little test case, you have to come up with a test fixture, uh, an array, the state that matches this test data pattern. Uh, you invoke the sorting method on, on this object, the, the, the array, and then you compare the array, and it should be sorted. But sorted can be in that direction, or it can be ascending or descending, okay? So you have to make sure, study the, uh, the specification so you don't compare with a descending array if it should be ascending, okay. Now we have exercise single methods in an API using this category partitioning. But that's not always the case, of course. Well, we test our working units. Now we know that the individual methods in here. But what if we start integrating them? An API typically is, is the, the uh, interface for, for, for something that has its own state. So, what we want to test now is a sequence of calls, a sequence of invocations where we have some initial state, we invoke some method, arrive at some other state, another method is invoked, we arrive at the third state, a fourth one, a fifth one, and hey, now it's time to observe. So this is integration testing, you know, objects collaborating, moving the state of the application, moving the state of the uh, a subsystem and we want to observe the subsystem again at the end so what we can use for this API testing is the use case so, so I should acknowledge Chris Collins for this one deriving test cases from use cases well you can see that cases and cases, they, they match. So are they similar? Yes, they are very similar. Because what is a use case? It's a behavioral specification. OK. What's a test case? It's a specification where we exercise the system, behavior. 
if we can see that when we exercise the system, the behavior matches the behavior as specified in the use case, very good. So this is similar to a control flow graph approach because we have the flows of events, but we don't know the structure of the code, we know the structure of the flow as specified in the use case. So identify the paths. This is similar to control flow graph. Paths through a use case. That is a scenario, remember? Based on these scenarios, come up with a test case, one or more per scenario. Now we have to control the flow through a use case. That's a slightly more difficult, slightly more challenging for them for a single function if we, single method if we have access to the source code. But with category partitioning or similar, we can do it. And there are also other possibilities, as you will see. We identify test case uh, cho choices and we add these uh, add va values, concrete values for different choices to complete the test case. So here's a use case example. Unlock screen case. You know, you have to do this or whatever. Swipe the screen, enter a, a passcode. Here are some flows. The basic flow is everything is fine. We unlock the screen at the end. Okay, But we have some invalid pa password or we have some cancel alternative flows for that use case. Okay. So when we initiate this use case, there is one possible path, the primary flow, that will go directly down to where we terminate the use case. Okay, But we also have one alternative flow here. And which one do you think this is? This is when you enter the wrong password. Okay. You go back, get another chance. And then we had the second alternative flow, cancel. And that leads us to another termination than the primary flow, because the primary flow will take us to, you're logged on to the system. Okay? The second alternative flow will take you to a, the logon screen again, because someone has canceled that operation. So what we have to come up with now is actually which scenarios should we test? Because we can sit all day entering the wrong password, at least according to this specification. But it's similar as for what we saw for the category partitioning. It doesn't matter if you try this twice or 15 times. It's code. It will not wear. So it's the same. Okay. So what you have to come up with is these uh, identifying scenarios that, that covers the flow, covers the code. Okay? So we have the basic flow. We have the basic flow, but wrong password. Basic flow, wrong password, cancel. Basic flow, cancel. Cover the flows in your use case. So, uh, how can we control this? Well, we have this. User selects unlock command. OK. System brings up logon screen. User enters valid user ID. Hey, controllable things. We can write up a test script that guides a human or some software to exercise this system in different ways in different scenarios, following different scenarios. So just look at this one. Unlock screen command, user ID, password, logon command, expected result, actual result. We can come up with some conditions here. We can say that the unlock screen command should be valid. Otherwise, we will not initiate this use case. OK? The user ID is valid, 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 not applicable, not applicable. That was when, when someone aborted. Okay, so here we have an assumption. Sorry, valid, 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 invalid. 
the first scenario was that the, the primary flow, everything was nice. The expected result is a log on, okay? The second one is an invalid password. Someone tries to log on, the result should be failure, return to log on, okay? The fourth one was a cal cancel. We don't care about the user ID or password. There was no logon command. It was a cancel. We should end up at the screen lock, with the screen locked. So now we just have to translate this, these conditions, these partitions into choices. OK. What we have here is some input parameters. Here are more input. Here are some uh, additional input. And then we have the expected result. And this is the actual result as observed. But there is more to it. Well, look at these two guys. What must we also do if this test case ID 1 should work? Well, we must see to that there, there is a state where the user ID CTC with the password ABC is in the system. So. When we write up the test case code, we have the uh, test fixture setting up maybe the database with users so that we have a username and a password like this. Then we can exercise the system. So now we talked about test suites, different objectives mostly functionality today, but uh, different types of objects, either units, methods, or integrations, APIs, bundles of objects, where we used uh, structural testing when we had access to the source code. We used uh, uh, category partitioning or this use case based to exercise well, what's hidden behind an API? What's a black box for us? Testing is much more. You know that when you use certain apps, certain uh, web apps, for instance, you have agreed to be a tester. Often in the, the license agreements, you have agreed to become a tester. Because there is something called testing in the wild. Companies, for instance, if you're a, 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 a bookstore, on the net. You have an e-store selling books. You can, of course, come up with many different ways, many different interfaces, paths through the purchasing process and so on. And what they're doing is that they are testing different, different user interfaces, different uh, processes for purchases. And then they measure. Then here, they're not testing for functionality. That has been done way before. What they're testing now for is what increases the sales most, what gives the best sales, this interface or that interface. Because, I admit, sometimes you go to an e-store just because you think the interface there is better than the other. And that's true. Testing in the wild, you are a tester yourself. But there is also, when we talk about incremental development, when we talk about iterative development, the fact that we are constantly changing what we tested before, or changing things that depends on what was tested before, or changing things that what we tested before depends upon. So it means that just because we executed exercise the system once, that's enough. No, we have to repeatedly come back and retest. A retest. And this is called regression testing. If you have changed something, you must test all elements that are dependent on this thing. 
Because you must be certain about that you don't introduce faults when you change. Because if you change something that passed the test two weeks ago and you don't rerun the test, you will have a faulty system at the end of the day. So that concludes testing. So observability, controllability. You need to have observability. You need to be able to control execution. Sometimes you have access to code, structural testing. If not, black box approaches. For the API or integration level, more challenging, as I said, category partitioning, use case based generation. But the message here, guys, is, is the following. Approach testing in a structured manner. Just don't sit down and try the system out because it will not work. Plan, replan for each iteration based on your workload or what you're supposed to do. Apply the techniques. Do your regression testing. It's so important because if we don't deliver system with functionality, system with quality as specified by the customer, the customer will never come back and possibly we will not get paid. So that was today's takeaway. And, and this is also the final lecture. We have one more guest lecture where we'll have an industrial perspective on all the things that I've talked about. But understand the software process. We have looked at requirements, we have looked at analysis and design, implementation, yes, how to come from a design to an implementation, testing, how important it is, but controlling the people, planning, reflecting on how you as an individual work or how your team works. It's so important that you learn from this because that will improve not just how skilled you are at the activities requirements, analysis, and design, implementation, and testing, because that's your craftsmanship, but also how good you are at estimating your own performance or your team's performance. And that's super important for planning, controlling your projects. So uh, that's it. Thank you.